everybody my uh... hey all right Vaughn you said something the other day that was critical and I forgot now but if you could, it was uh what did you say anyway I forgot so I wanted to see if you could say that again type that again Vaughn what you had said on the live stream the other day and I man I forgot what it was but I was like man that's 100% spot on we just make sure the rumble is going here hold on just a second let's get ready to rumble <laughs> Second, we are wait, did I not put it on Rumble? Hmm, thought I did. Okay. Wait. No, is it, man? I guess I didn't put it on Rumble. Why did I, I thought I I guess I'm not on Rumble today. Could have sworn I did, man. Playing shit. Hold on a second. I guess not. Oh, that's right. Because Rumble, you can't. Ah, that's what it is. And Rumble, you can't do it in advance. You have to do it. Uh, you could, I couldn't do it five days in advance. I had to do it. I forgot. Okay. Um, so no Blanchett today, unless he comes on later, because he is uh, he's taking his in-laws down to the Social Security Administration to ask, uh, oh, well, there he is. There's Blanchett. Hey, David, can you hear me? Hold on a second. Can, David, are you can hear me? I can't hear you. Are you, uh, there you go. Can you hear me okay? Hey, hey, Blanchett, man, right on. I never talked to you, David. Good to meet What's you. Hold on. Brother. What, did you go down to Social Security Administration? I did. It was my first time there. Now, where are you exactly? Pennsylvania? So I'm in Kentucky. In Kentucky. What part of Kentucky? Lexington. Oh, man. Right on. Are you native of Kentucky? Born and raised, yeah. Really? All in yeah. Lexington? Uh, uh, yeah, Lexington. I mean, so my, my parents are here. My wife's from here. Uh, we've moved around a bit, but um, back home now, so. Well, cool, man. I was just getting ready to tell everybody that it looked like you might not join us today. We'd have to push off till next week. And then, you, lo and behold, there made you it, are. Made this, it. This, this is fantastic. All right. Let me uh, close. So you can see how formal this is. I got uh, one of my dogs there. And he'll That's make, great. That's great. I got my other dog will be coming up. I'm in my main T-shirt. And I just want to. Uh, all right. So, David, I got I have wide open time. If you got a hard time to cut off, you just tell me. But I just. uh First and foremost, folks, we got uh, David Blanchett has been doing uh, financial planning research for as I mean, hell's bells. I mean, for a long, long time. I've been following Blanchett for many, many, many moves. Uh, we've communicated on occasion on uh, LinkedIn and uh, maybe on uh, via advisor perspectives or something right. like that, camera. But uh, just a good all around guy. Uh, but uh, so I can't remember the reason I had talked initially. Some guy was saying something about Monte Carlo, which we'll get into later. And Blanchett was uh, was not afraid to uh, to take it to him. And then, of course, that guy blocked him. And I was like, man, Blanchett's my kind of guy. He doesn't hold back. And I love that because too many people in our industry is like, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. It's like, yeah, screw that, man. Uh, retirement planning. If people get offended by retirement planning, they can freaking screw off. So anyway, so I want to get into a little bit of a deep dive with, with David, and then you know we'll open up for questions later. Um, if you have questions, guys, uh, type them in, ca- in caps down there in the uh, the show notes so I can see that you have a question for Blanchett. Uh, because if you don't type them in caps, I can't tell if you guys are just talking to each other or not. So, all right. So, David, um, man, I tell you, this is great. So you're you're a native of Kentucky. Your wife's a native of Kentucky, but you moved around to your Air Force or an Army or something. Oh like that. no, no, no! I meant like uh, I went to business school. My wife went to veterinary school, but oh. no, no. My my parents were both public school teachers for twenty seven and twenty eight years, so we were oh, okay. uh, pretty locked in in terms of location growing up. So you graduated high school, went to University of Kentucky. Let's go Cats, baby! Yeah. All right. Well, they got smoked by Iowa. Huh? Oh man, that was a, that was a terrible game. <laughs> Big Ten, Big Ten representing against the SEC. Are you going to go for Georgia in the uh, football championship there? Yeah, I am. Um, you know, I, I watched both those games. Those were both pretty crazy. So I was, you know, I was disappointed um, that uh, that Michigan lost, but I was excited to see Georgia win. So yeah, all right, right on. You, um, I'm a 
I'm very much looking forward to 2024 when they actually have a playoff for once. This right. is not a playoff. This is silly. Right. But, uh, uh, hey, it's uh, patience is a virtue, I've heard. And, uh, and I've been, uh, you know, the freaking BCS and the previous the BCS, now what we got is all a communist plot to, uh, to tick me off. It's been the bane of my existence. There isn't a college football playoff. I'm like, just every other sport has a playoff. Every other sport. So. What other divisions that play yes. college football have a playoff? Yes. So it's not just like they can't exist, right? What I'm saying, I'm like every single division, division three, two, right. FCS or FBS, whatever it's called, I can't remember. But uh, all right, so then you get out of college. Did you meet your wife in college? Uh, we were actually high school sweethearts. Wow. Ah, um, so I know. That's, and she stuck with very you. Original, very original, very huh? original. Uh, but I've been, I, you know, I, I'm i interested in the, I've been drawn to the field of financial planning since high school. Um, I did a bunch of, in, of internships in high school, did a bunch of stuff in college. I've always known I wanted to be in the field. Yeah, um, and I've kind of, I've done a, a few, a few different things. I think I've kind of settled into what I may be, uh, best at or the least bad at. Is your wife a veterinarian right now? She is. Yeah. She's, uh, she does, um, uh, we're, we're in Kentucky, but she yeah. does small animals. Yeah, okay. Um, and she focuses on rehabilitation. So okay. mostly older pets that, um, are near the end of their lives that need, um, uh, specialty care. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And you have kids, David? I have four kids. Hey, um, on, three, five, three, six, seven, and 10. That's it. Three, six. So well, I, I, I always joke that my wife wanted to have four kids and I wanted to have two kids. And so we compromised on four kids. Um, <laughs> that's it. No, that's it. We're not, there's not, there's no more, there's no more children in, in our future. So I got four kids too, man. My my youngest just turned uh, fifteen, uh, oh, wow. December thirty first. I, I, how old are you? Roughly forty five, something like that. Forty one. Forty one. Okay, gotcha. Right on, man. So four kids, boys and girls combination. What do you got? A uh, girl, boy, boy, boy. How about you? Uh, I got two and two. The oldest two are girls. The youngest two are boys. So uh, right on, man. My oldest is twenty two. My youngest is fifteen. So uh, oh, wow. yeah, we're popping. We have Irish twins. Our last two are Irish twins. You ever heard that terminology? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I'm a twin. So yeah. Another term. Oh, no kidding, man. All right, right on. All right, so, I mean, your parents are public school teachers, and somehow in high school you were interested in financial planning. How, did they? Did your dad tell you about stock markets or something like that, or what? No, I just, I, I don't know what it was. Um, just always interested in the markets in the field. It wasn't just, it's never been just investment management. Like, I never wanted to go out and, and necessarily, like, you know, just be like a, a stock picker. Um right. I mean, I, I, I do enjoy the portfolio aspect of the of all of it, but I guess that never has been kind of my, my only focus. It's been a lot, a lot broader. How did when you what was your first gig financial planning oriented? Like Ed Jones knocking on doors or something like that? Or well, so I you know, I, I did internships at a lot of brokerage companies back when people were called stockbrokers yeah. um, in high school. Yeah. Um, in college, I did a few more internships. I was at the Board of Trade. I did some kind of internships. I actually uh, sold life insurance for a few years at Northwestern Mutual. Yeah. Um, I did a lot. I mean, I actually, I actually took the CFP when I was 20, 21 years old. Um, when I graduated college, I had like three or four designations. Um, so I was kind of, I was always gearing up towards this field um, from a relatively young age. But you wanted, I mean, I mean, I've been reading you since probably in the FPA or GFP, probably 2005 or six, maybe. I mean, yeah, it's been, I've been doing research for good for at least 15, at least 15 years. Now, so. But were you doing that at Northwestern Mutual? Probably not, right? Well, no. So I would have been, at, you know, I mean, 15 years ago, I was 25, 26. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that was when I was like 18 years old. I was, yeah. I was actually still in college then, so. so. You were still in college when you were doing the research and writing for the Journal for Financial Planning? No, no, that was when, so um, I was doing an internship in Northwestern Mutual at the time. That's when I was 18. I didn't start doing oh, research, but I was maybe yeah. like, okay. and I was like mid-20s. Um, one thing that was actually really interesting and really good for me was I found out when I was in my internship that um, that they would pay for designations as long as you met your minimum sales requirements. Well, there aren't any for an intern. So effectively, they would just pay for all these different tests that I would take. And as it turned out, I ended up really focusing on that. So I kind of pivoted away from, you know, building a book and selling to like learning about financial planning. And that really, I think, changed the trajectory of my career. So how did like you were right? I mean, how did you get published in the Journal for Financial Planning? Just submitted an article to them in like mid 2000s. They're like, hey, I well. submitted a lot of papers to them originally and they, they weren't very good. So I mean, you know, it, <laughs> I'd like to think I'm a little bit better at doing research over the last, say, 15, 20 years. But yeah, like um, I think 
you know, one of the one of the very first things that interested me, I'll never forget, was talking about the differences in like a deterministic forecast, so like time value of money, present value, versus some kind of Monte Carlo forecast and what that means in terms of implications on retirement, on saving, all that. And so that's kind of where I started. Um, sure. Yeah. And I mean, to be honest, a lot of the first things I did were looking back were absolute train wrecks. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, like over time, I would say I got I got better at it. And, and, and here I am today. So Yeah, right on, man. All right. So the first big paper that you got some notoriety was what? Was it the... Uh, well, you tell me. I mean, I don't know what it would be. You tell me. You know, what, probably what? the first thing that I won an award for, I think it was in 2007, it was the, the Journal of Financial Planning, uh, Financial Frontiers Award. Yeah. Um, it was looking at the 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 optimal distribution glide path shape. So yes. if, you're, if you've got yeah. money in retirement, um, what what shape should it be? All right. And then you, so you, you got that. And next thing you know, you're being pounded on like David, do some research for us, like morning stars. You know, no one ever actually, you know, it's funny is even now, like people don't necessarily ask me to do research. There isn't like people that are saying, Hey, do this. I've just, I, I am, I am incredibly inquisitive. I almost, I am up almost every night testing random things and people yeah. are like, Oh, you get a lot done. Well, I mean, you, you guys only see the stuff that works out. I mean, yeah. there's so many things I do that, you know, I test and I'm like, ah, I can't do that. I get data sets. I just, I, I don't know. I, I think I was raised to be inquisitive. And so I just really yeah. like, I like answering questions. So I know the answer, right? It's yeah. not that I don't, I don't trust people. Um, it's just that if, if I've spent the time to really understand how it works, yeah. what the pros and cons yeah. are, I can, I think I can give someone, I, I feel more confident talking about things that I truly have spent time researching and I like to research everything. So that's what I spend a lot of time doing. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%, man. And I think the, uh, that, that uh, paper in 2007 is where I think I got introduced to you, which, um, and then you start doing a lot of research. How would you end up in Morningstar, by the way? I'm just curious, like, cause you, you were there for oh, a few years. I was there for about a decade. Um, so I was at my, uh, the first company. I actually was with Hilliard Lions. Now I think it's WR Baird. Okay. Um, right out of school, working part of a financial planning team and a group. Um, then I went to um, a, a company called American Trust Unified Trust for about a decade too. That, yes, and, that's right. Yeah. And my and my wife got into and, and so I actually got my MBA at University of Chicago when I was there. Um, I took kind of a break for two oh, years. So you and moved I actually, to Chicago. I did. Yeah, I did move to Chicago. So then oh, I actually yeah. went back to work there after I finished. But then my wife got into school uh, to vet school at Iowa State, and the the role that I had um, it wasn't very conducive to being remote. And I, I did an internship with Morningstar when I was at, getting my MBA. I kept in touch, and I was like, "Hey, how do you all feel about me being remote for you guys?" And they didn't love it, but they were willing to try it. And so I was remote for them um, first in Iowa, and then in Kentucky for about ten years. And I left about um, a year and a half ago to join okay. Prudential or really PGM. Um, yeah. Where I'm also remote, um, working in Kentucky. All right, gotcha. So you had to, you were literally living in Chicago with your wife. Uh, did you have kids back then? No, we didn't. We didn't have kids until uh, she was in veterinary school. So yeah. I, I was in business school. Um, gosh, when was that? That was when I was maybe 27, 28. So no kids until we were like early 30s. I guess okay. 31 right. would be about the right. age. So right on. And so then you uh, moved back to Kentucky. Now. All right, so I want to go deep into your dive on uh, retirement, retiree spending, because mm -hmm. a pet peeve, I, David, I just, so my story is, I've been, you know, I'm 10 years old and you were a little bit, well, maybe 11, but, so I started in 1998, I started, I cut my teeth at Vanguard, I was in college, mm -hmm. I was introduced to French Fama through my economics professors at George cool. Mason University, and and I always, I just, you know, I love the three factor, which is now the five or the seven or the 25,000 factor and the yeah. evidence-based investing. I just hate all that crap. Um, anyway, and I, I don't mean I hate all the crap with French fam. I just hate all the, the industry jargon to try to prove that we're some kind of science. Then I came across, and I'll never forget that Ty Bernicke article in the FPA in 2005, where the uh, reality retirement spending and the fire calc dot. Uh, calm calculator that you know kind of adjusts your spending downward, and I'll never forget. Uh, you're, you're familiar with that. I, I you're, Ty Bernicke, okay. So, Ty Bernicke out of Wisconsin had written an article in 2005 in the financial plan of the JFP that talked about reality retirement spending, where the retirement spending drops as people age. And, and I and I'll never forget Jonathan Clements of all people. And he used to be with the Wall Street Journal, and I forgot that Jason's Zweig, I think, took his place, another British guy. But anyway, he said, oh, the reason that retirees are spending less is because they're running out of money. 
And he just, I'll never forget that. And uh, and Ty was somewhat defensive because Ty was just a, and I don't know this guy, but he was just a regular financial planner. And, and here's Jason, or not Jason, well, Clements kind of, you know, calling him out. And I said, and I remember he's like, oh, well, maybe, but we don't have any evidence of that. We just know that when my running, the BLS numbers, this is what I see. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and then a couple years later, here comes Blanchett. You know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, that's fantastic. This is because I say, I, I remember I said, I had a client. I used to, I went to high school and um, college in the Washington, D.C. area. And this is when the Redskins were, like, what can I say, Redskins? Anyway, the Redskins were huge. Like you had to, you literally pass season tickets through the generation through your will. And um, I'll never forget, I had a guy. I said, you, the Redskins were playing the Cowboys on like Monday Night Football or something like that. And back in the day, you know, this isn't probably mid to late 2000s. That was a big ticket. You know what I'm saying? Because the Redskins and Cowboys. I, I had a client. I said, man, you go on the game night. He goes, nah, I, I gave up my tickets. I said, why? He goes, because and I'm just getting old. I don't want to do that. I just like in my house. I don't, you know, I just don't get out that much anymore. I just, I just, I'm pretty comfortable sitting around and watching football on TV. And it clicked. And at the same time, I was reading your stuff after having been introduced to Ty Bernicke stuff. I said, there's something here, man. People as they age, their spending doesn't go up linear, a la the 4% rule. It right. drops. Now, that doesn't mean it's all inclusive. It doesn't mean, but but the models that we're using that this inflation adjusts spending on a linear basis, I said, that, that where's the evidence of that? So anyway, tell me how you came to, to find that. Because I, I just, that's one of the best pieces of research that's out there that is still not taking over the industry. It's nuts to me. So, you know, I had heard, even when I was doing my internships in accounting in college about this idea of like the, the really fun, like the slow go, the, yes. the go, go, the slow go, the no go years. And I was yeah. like, well, that's, that's a really interesting theory that people don't increase their consumption every year by inflation. I mean, literally like the models we use say that you somehow know that inflation last year was like, Six percent, you can you know, like every year, just you know, without right. failing, you spend it all. And I was like, well, like I wonder what 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 the data suggests on that. Right. There had been some research done, but what I did is I I used a data set called the Health and Retirement Study, and I looked at well, you know, how do it, it tracks households over time? You know, how does their spending change? And I think consistent with with what you see in a lot of places is that is that what we found, or I, what I found, is that it didn't increase every year by inflation. Now it does for some folks. What's really important here. Is like is like yeah. Some folks just go crazy. Some folks don't. But the average the average outcome was that individuals do tend to spend a little bit less in today's dollars over time. So if inflation's three percent, they only spend maybe one or two percent more, and that really can add up over a twenty or thirty year time horizon when it comes to retirement. And so you know, and what I did find is that is that individual expenses tend to tick up like later in life. There's a really important nuance there though, is that the average the average expense ticks up, but the median does not. So the yeah. median, it just keeps dropping, but the average goes way up at the end because like one in five, one in 10, whatever number you want to use, have some kind of like significant out-of-pocket medical expense. And so I think the, to me, like the implications there is just that this notion that individuals are going to spend more, it doesn't hold reality. And people say, well, David, you know, to your earlier point, people spend less because they have to, because we're yeah. in this retirement savings crisis. Right. And actually, that, that's not the truth. So what you can do in the data set is you can isolate the folks who have just tons and tons of money right. and aren't spending a whole lot for whatever reason. And what you find is that they tend to spend less as well. Right. So it is true that individuals who who are over consuming, they, they drop their consumption by the most. Yeah. But most retirees tend to reduce their spending in today's dollars over time. I think that's been kind of well, well borne out in in the literature and the research at this point. Well, I, you know, I, it, it is. And I just, you know, like one of your articles, the you know, retirement spending smile that, yeah. uh, you know, Wade Fow had wrote about as well, using your, your data. Um, I just had to let my dog out. Um, you, you go into the lit. Oh, now my other dog's back. Okay. You go into the Here's my other one. I just want to. Oh, there he goes. Oh, there he is. You can see the big brown eye. He's uh he's trying to get a only uh, dogs fans page. You know, only fans, but only fans for dogs. He likes to show everybody his big brown eyes. Fantastic. Very professional, David. I'm telling you. Tell. Can tell. <laughs> um. By the way, you went over the litany of the various articles and studies and everything, and and there's 
there's just none. <laughs> Maybe one from Italy. There, there's a say. few, and there's actually been a lot, a lot more done since then. I think that the individuals that run or kind of in charge of the, the HRS have done a lot since then, kind of trying to explore the effect. I think, I think to me, the key is just that, you know, assuming that, you know, you reduce your spending by two percent versus inflation, can have a tremendous impact on can you take that cruise at age sixty-five, right? So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, just kind of acknowledging there's a decent chance that you're going to slow down a little bit. So if you're a little bit constrained, if you're behind, maybe it's okay to take that cruise. Just being aware yes, that if things, yes. if they, so I think to me that's that that's how I talk about that to advisors and retirees is that is that I think it can, can kind of shift how you think about spending your savings. Well, here's what's gonna, and I don't want to hold you accountable. You don't have to say this, but here's what pisses me off about our industry, like the Boston College and you know, the Center for Retirement Research up there, and all this. They show these pending retirement crises built on the idea. Uh, it's just so freaking. It's just it's bad, bad data sense, and I don't get how it's not just them. It's you know this Teresa Jared Geldy lady. It's you know from the new school. Yes, yes. It's yes. all these guys, and I and I'm like, there's something fundamental, and this is just me. I'm not putting this on David, but I don't understand other than you know they're being backed by these various industry groups. You know the pension, you know the annuities and the mm -hmm. TIA credits of the world. I just don't get it. Why are they not using the moderate approach that says, yes, you, we, we are planning for a spending adjust with inflation, but the evidence on that is, 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 is suspect, or at least just there's, a, there's another model here. But they don't ever do this, and they're pushing this retirement crisis. And it, it, so I had a guy, this guy named Andy Biggs, who used to be the second guy, the chief actual, well, one of the, not chief actual, one of the guys from Social Security Administration. I've talked to him a number of times on this channel. Mm -hmm. And his data set is that not only are people not running out of money, you know, 80% are actually content in retirement. So, right. and he was a lot more diplomatic because he's kind of politician oriented. And that, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean, he's got to be more diplomatic than I have to be. But I was like, but why, why are they pushing this so that people still have to dig their dishes when they're, dig ditch, when they're 65, when they could retire? What, what is happening? And it just, infuriates me and i'm not saying we have to say oh you know you can retire with a buck but i'm just saying the all the data from our industry is that we're, there's this retirement crisis and it's just not there any, any thoughts on that by chance so i don't we do not have a retirement crisis right a retirement crisis in my opinion is grandma and granddad living on cat food yes, yes. So that we have one of the most generous public social systems in the world Social Security is a very, very generous system versus other public pensions. And so right now, we do not have a retirement crisis, okay? We do potentially have a retirement savings crisis, whereby a lot of Americans aren't saving enough for retirement. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to have an okay retirement. People, right. yeah, retirees are a happy bunch. You know, one of my right. favorite surveys about retirement was, was one that Vanguard did, I don't know, like five years ago. They asked, they asked all these people, yep. like, is there a retirement crisis? And half of them say yes. Right. Right. And then they say, well, would you describe your situation as a crisis? Right. And like, and like 10% said, yeah, I'm in crisis. So there's just, I think there's this perception that there's this issue with savings. And now I, I think we can do a lot to like improve access to retirement savings vehicles to get folks to save more. And it will mean, it will mean changes in retirement, but I really, I, you know, I really kind of, I've, I've recoiled for at least a decade. Sometimes we have a retirement crisis because we, we don't folks need to be saving where we need to be doing things. But most, most Americans have a pretty good retirement based upon the public systems that we've created for them right now that they're paying into that right it's not just i mean we are paying for this it's not just right. an entitlement it's, it's, it's a, a relatively progressive system and that's okay and that's how most that's how most public pensions work but i think that i you know we don't have a retirement crisis we, we might have a retirement savings crisis and we're and we're doing things as a country to address it we just had secure 2.0 pass that would hopefully like increase coverage increase adoption all these things so we're doing things to improve the system a lot of folks like someone that you just mentioned wants to burn the system system down okay yes this is america like it, this what like how, how, how can you honestly believe that if you start from scratch you won't end up having some kind of flawed system like it's just like people are crazy like stuff happens i think we're you know the, the goal that we should have collectively for folks to do this is to improve our system and we are we're making progress well the uh I mean, another thing that's annoying to me is this idea that everyone had a pension in the good old days. It's just not true. Right. And I just, I don't, and I look, we're, we're speculating, well, I am, but why, what is the the reason for that? And I don't know. 
know, and I don't need to know. But I'm just like, it's not true that everyone had a pension in the old days. It's not true that there are a bunch of grandmas eating cat food. It's not true that everyone's going to be living in long-term care facility. And yet this permeates our, our business. It's just the weirdest thing. I had a guy who had like a million bucks in his 401k. I can't remember. And his, his financial advisor said, laughed when he said he asked if he could retire at 62. And he'd even ask about his expenses. And I'm like, I, I just, I literally don't understand. I don't get it. And I, uh, and I'm just wondering why it seems like you and maybe Wade kids us and a couple others, me, you know, but it, we're, it seems like we're, we're just preaching howling at the moon here. And I, I don't, I just don't get it, man. I, I just, it seems to me that you'd have a lot more happier people who would engage in financial planning if they didn't feel like they're going to be laughed at if they only have a million bucks. And I just, it's weird to me. I, I don't well, know. I mean, you know, I mean, very few folks have a million dollars. Exactly. Right? Like, That's you know, exactly. I, to me, it's, it's, it's where I worry most is like the mass affluent, like individuals that yes. have, have been doing what they can. They haven't made a lot of money. They've got something to say for retirement. Like, where do you get good advice today? Like, where do you get high quality, unbiased, advice and you know like so personally i i like the i like the the expansion of 401k plans where there's more of an emphasis on keeping folks in plan post-retirement because in, there you have an institutional fiduciary who's creating you know strategies and products for clients and i mean i i, I know tons of great advisors like i've been i've been doing on uh, reason the value of advice for over a decade I, yeah. you know the problem is there's this massive dispersion in what it even means to be a financial advisor Right. And so what, what worries me is, you know, you get people that have smaller balances and how is how is two hundred thousand dollars a small balance? It's not. Right. right but right. It, 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 it leads it might lead them to individuals that would recommend products and strategies that don't have their you know their best interests at heart. Now, you know, I, I, it's important I say this. I, I'm also a, a big fan of of annuities and products mm. that, that can provide lifetime income. But mm. it, it, it all needs to be like done with good measure. Like, you know, like I'm not talking about that crappy product that has a 20 percent surrender charge right, and right. 8 percent a year. I'm talking about like building either good portfolios or whatever else. But there's just I, think, I just think there's this big disconnect in our industry in terms of the quality of advice that you would receive across from different advisors. Well, the quality of research too. That, that's another thing that frustrates me is that, you know, the lack of, you know, good research, like what you do. Um, now we're just, you know, and then you get the, not Morningstar, the market watch. And they're just, you know, basically they hire these interns essentially that, you know, they just, they scour the, the, the world about, you know, finance at Yahoo, you know, market watch. And, and they just, they throw these crappy articles out there that, that are very, clickbaited and um and then people think there's this again this retirement savings cri retirement crisis which actually i did a video and i went back in a newspapers.com i have a you know, subscription to new york times newspapers and newspapers.com and you can go in there and type in retirement crisis and you can go back to the 80s retirement crisis there'll be no social security the 90s the aughts and i'm like it's odd to me. Like, everyone's worried about Social Security. I said, have they ever looked at the Medicare financing? So if we're if we're if we're worried about Social Security, and I say, how are you going to pay for health care? I'm going to Medicare. I said, there seems to be a little bit of a uh, bigger a gap problem. there. <laughs> exactly right, because Medicare is in a world of hurt compared to Social Security. What um, just some guy said asked about like what would you think would be a good? And this is a very broad based question, obviously. In terms of a good savings rate, I just literally just generalized speaking, if someone said, man, I want to have a, a comfortable, I don't need to have gold plated tennis shoes, but I just a comfortable retirement, you know, any guidance that would say, hey, this is a pretty good number to get started with anything on that. I mean, I would say 15 percent. And that it sounds really high. That's a combination of your contribution and your employer's contribution, because the one thing that I just I just don't. That we can believe in or rely on is that the markets to do as well as the number yes, last hundred plus years. Completely. I mean, the U.S. has had like one of the best. Co we didn't lose a world war. I mean, like you know, things worked out really well for us. And other countries like Japan, for yep. Italy, and others like you know hasn't done nearly as well. And so I yep. think, <laughs> I yes. think, I think saving saving more is, is 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 it creates options, right? You know, if you have saved a lot, if you've been a good saver, you can retire early. You can go on more vacation. And so I mean, like I, I think there is a balance. Like I don't, I'm not like a big fan of this whole fire thing where folks are like saving 80 percent of their pay wow. and living the off cap like that doesn't make any sense to me i think that you know saving maybe i think we will have to save more moving forward given returns but i would say 15 percent is a, a, a decent starting target 
what's what are your thoughts on returns? So I, I use the Vanguard models in my own planning software. Yeah, the, the VC, the the VV, the VCMM. I, I think I mean we, we P Jim does them. Everyone does them. I think that the one thing that's really important with with capital market assumptions when you're using them in a plan is that they match the duration of the plan. And honestly, it doesn't really matter much right now because the current bond yield environment is very is relatively similar to long term averages. Yeah. What worries me is like where we were like a year and a half or yes, two years right, ago yeah. with really low bond yields. And I don't want someone to assume that bond yields are super low forever because right. I didn't think that they would be. I didn't know when they were going to change. But I think that, you know, if you have like or or. If for some reason a year from now we've got bond yields that are like 10%, you yeah. wouldn't want to use 10% for a 50-year projection. So I think that the key, if you can use like a like a, a nearer term rate that reflects the current economic realities, and then a longer term rate for like years 11 to whatever, that that's a better way than kind of you know always using just like these most most capital market assumptions are 10-year, 17-year estimates, yeah. just using the near term estimate for the entire plan. How about with the equity side? What would you say? And you know, obviously, we're not holding accountable. I'm just, how do you? So, I'm a big fan of Bogle. So, earnings growth plus dividend yield, obviously, contraction or expansion of P's. That's it. But how, how do you guys, with you know, PGIM or your, even your stuff with Morningstar, how would you come up with your? equity potential returns the next 10 years. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, like I think I think a really good proxy is just, you know, five ish percent plus bond yields. I mean, like this equity risk premium is, you know, it, 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 that varies, right? There are times where it's going to be six percent and then yeah. three and a half percent. But like, you know, I think a good proxy as well, if bonds are giving you are giving you four ish, you know, stock should give you four or five ish more than that because they're a lot more volatile. And that's not a bad place to be. Now, if we if, if for some reason we get back to a place where bonds are only doing one ish or two ish i think you've got to you've got to haircut your equity assumptions yeah uh, but that's but that but that's i mean nobody knows right like this is just, it's all just a fantastic guess and i mean you want to use realistic assumptions but fundamentally markets are uncertain i mean look where we are today i never would have thought we'd have yields move where they were last year who knows what's going to happen this year right i mean the worst bond market anyone walking this earth has ever seen is crazy right. man i mean well, when you have a low starting point and bond yields go up i mean you're gonna you're gonna get hit there you know i, mean, I, was, I was actually talking i was talking to my, my in-laws today i was like even if even if you see the same increase in yields this year it won't be as bad because you're starting from a higher spot right you're starting from four and a half percent so when we hope that yields don't go up well maybe it'd be nice if they go up three points but like it you know it was just it was like the worst possible absolute and relative increase that we've ever seen blanchett if i wasn't happily married i'd come to kentucky and give you a big smooch on your lips right now uh, except i don't dig dudes uh but the, the reason for that is because this thing called log you know what i'm saying so you go from one to four it's a hell of a lot different from going from four to seven you know what i'm saying right. it's like it's not the same percentages. And that's one other thing that ticks me off. All these people, like, I get ticked off a lot about it. I, I love it. There's so many good people in our industry. I hate the fear mark. I hate it with a passion because it keeps people doing. I'm I, Look, I love Jesus. You know, loving the Lord is wrong. I don't want to be right. But at the end of the day, we're not put on this earth to dig ditches for some freaking hedge fund manager named Mitt Romney. We're on this earth to, to proclaim the, the gospel. That's just my opinion. You don't have to agree. I don't care. I like to care. But at the end of the day, and so this fear mongering is, my opinion, satanic. It's trying to get people to keep, you know, digging the ditches, digging the dishes, the ditches, as opposed to proclaiming what we're supposed to be proclaim under the Great Commission. Point being is, when you look at the bonds at one and they move to four, that's a three hundred percent. Now four to seven is not a three hundred percent, and people don't want to make that assumption. Oh my goodness! It's like no, no, no. It's completely different from a logarithm as opposed to a, just a, a regular linear thing. Um, what, what are you just tell me about your thoughts on Monte Carlo? Because Monte, I like Monte Carlo, it's not the cast meow. I get it, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I forgot the guy's name, O'Day, or something like that. Jim Ote, I forgot he did a, a kind of good takedown of it. I forgot his name, but um, he does back casting, I believe, is his thing, or something. So, like yeah, that. and I actually, I very much uh, like his stuff. Um, I but with that said, I think Monte Carlo is the best thing to you know, in terms of projections into the future because we don't know. We, I mean, right. hell, we could get nuked tomorrow. What's your overall take on Monte Carlo? What would if you don't? What would you prefer if if you're not a fan, or is there anything you prefer? So, so I, I would say that I I mean you know I, I'm very aware that no one knows what's going to happen, right? I think I think that we need to provide context on uncertainties for clients, yes. right? You know, there's just things that can happen. So what it does is it gives it gives it researchers, advisors the opportunity to kind of model what could possibly happen. I think that. 
there are, there are potential issues with how we measure outcomes in Monte Carlo. Like usually the outcomes metric is success rates. And that is right. a, that's an overly conservative estimate. Like just because you fail, doesn't mean you've, it just means you've had to make a change when you're 97 years old. So I think that my concern is that, you know, to your earlier point about fear mongering is like, is like, if you don't understand how they work structurally, you may target outcomes that are way, way, way too conservative. It results in underspending. So I think that, that, you know, it provided our industry with a level of financial sophistication, but I'm not convinced a lot of advisors who use the tool really understand how to use the inputs and outputs correctly. I completely agree. And then, and then they'll say a 10% probability of failure is the equivalent of a plane crash. You know? <laughs> I've seen that exact reference online. And I, and I, so the thing is, you know, what, what, what gets me is, 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 I mean, I'm an adult and I, I can be, I can be a little prickly. Right. Like if you're going to post garbage right. and I call it garbage, don't like get, don't get mad at me because I was, I didn't say, Oh, will you please fix your, your right. crazy wrong? No, I'm going to be like, that's ridiculous. Like that right. is not a correct way to think about this. And so, I mean, do do people get mad at me because I'm a little honest sometimes? Well, yeah, but like, you know, it, it's based upon to me. I have this, I have this thing. My response is usually driven by the quality and consistency of your post. When I engage someone, usually out of the gate, it's a new person. I give them a little bit of slack, but like if someone consistently posts things that I think are 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 in, in, intentionally incorrectly conveying information, to maybe help someone to make a sale. I'm not. I'm not going to be as nice. I just. I can't be like that's not. That, you know. So I, you know, people get people especially get when they got you know tens of thousands of followers. You see what I'm saying? I mean. They got tens of thousands of, and I still don't know who this guy is on LinkedIn. I don't, you don't need to say anything, but just so folks, uh, Blanchett, <laughs> yeah, some guy said a 10% probability is equivalent of a, of a plane crash. And Blanchett's like, what the hell, dude? That's nuts. And anyway, the guy, I was a bit more me. diplomatic, but I, mean, I was like, I was like, that's like no serious act. I was like, no serious academic right. would ever use that argument to justify what right. you're talking about. And so I think, like, like, you know, the, the, what got what kills me is like, is he never said I was wrong? He right. never, you know, like so. Like if you're if you're gonna get mad at me because I call you out, right. provide some context as to what you're mad about, other than the fact that I called you out. Because to me, what the, I mean, you know, I I'm not like the like the like the truth police on LinkedIn, right, right. but I think that you know, like, but, but people see these things and and it and it can be misleading. And so you know, people say, oh, David, you know, you should be nice and gentle. Well, like. No, like he's using this, he's using this platform to say things that, that I believe are incorrect. And now here's the thing. If, if you, if you disagree with me, I'm more, I love, I love a good debate. Absolutely. You know, but, but rarely, rarely when, when I call some, I don't think it's, I mean, or they, or they have, or they have a really good explanation for why they think this and what they, you know, what they're trying to convey and all this stuff. And so that to me has been an ongoing issue and, I, and i'm gonna maybe be a little nicer this year we're in a new year right now but we'll see we'll see that's uh i'm gonna debate with a guy well-known guy on advisor perspectives and um i just i i i just don't it's it's weird to me because he's like well josh you don't have any legitimacy because you said there's no inflation i said I literally never said that not sure why you would say i'm saying that i asked for evidence that a spend a retiree spend linear with the adjust for CPI. Where is the evidence of that? Because it is really, it's just, we just talked about this, but it's like, look, we can debate all day long, but don't put words in my mouth or don't put something out there. That's freaking just, it's, it's ludicrous. I, I'm not being as diplomatic as you, but that, you know, the fall a 10% uh, failure is the equivalent of, of your plane crashing. I mean, give me a flip and break. Well, but, then, but the problem there is then the implicit is, is, is that you need a byproduct that's guaranteed, right? Because you won't crash. Well, and the point that I made in the in the link, uh, the in the think of piece is like, well, you actually can still crash if you buy an annuity. Like technically, you could have a liquidity event. There could be inflation. Other things can happen. So this notion that somehow you've eliminated risk with the product, it just doesn't track true reality. Like maybe like the weird, like the ways that we model it in Monte Carlo, because it's not accurate it reflects that and so I'm, i mean i'm not trying to be like negative towards a category i'm just trying to be more realistic like hey like that's not how you should convey the outcome you need to acknowledge the risks of of other products that might have guarantees because there's other ways that they could fail a client yeah and don't forget monte carlo what was 95 percent uh last year is down 83 percent because the markets are down 20 right percent you see what i'm saying it's like a monte carlo is not a static thing this was no, no. 
Hey, what? So tell me about going to the Social Security Administration. Go into that a little bit. I'd like to hear. I've never been, and I just want to hear what you did, if you don't mind sharing, and, and how it shook out. Sure. So I went today with with my with my in laws. They're getting really near retirement, and so this is your wife's with, parents, right? My wife's parents. That's correct. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And so I went to the local office. I'd driven by it a few times. I'd never been in before. Um, it was it wasn't that busy. It was it was it was just interesting. And then so we were talking with the there was a very Did nice you have lady. An appointment, David? You had an appointment set up. Already? No, we just showed up. We just showed up. So. Okay. Um, we just showed up and, um, you know, I asked the lady some questions. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively knowledgeable on social yeah. security stuff. I'm not like, I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the nuanced details, but it was, it was neat to have the, you know, just to have the, the discussion with the person that she was, she was very knowledgeable. She was very, very, you know, very knowledgeable. And then also just them, because it's a very personal decision. Right. And yeah. I think that there's, there's, there are unique situations when you've got different benefit ranges and ages and health that comes into play. I mean, I'm, I'm very much an advocate of delaying claim as long as you can. Um, at least until full retirement age. But then right. after that, you know, it really becomes a lot more personal. So I think to me, it was a, it was a, you know, it, no one else, it was a fun experience to kind of see that and, and just kind of experience what it's like to go there, ask the questions. You actually, as it turns out, you can't, I didn't know this, you can't claim that you've got to go either online or have a, an online conversation with someone with the administration. But that was, it was, it was fun. So you go down there, um, and your parent, your your are they are they at full retirement age? Or are they sixty? They both are. They both are past full retirement age. Okay. Yes. And so, is there a spousal benefit too, or just or just their own individual retirement? Benefit? Well, and so that was that was what, some of the ambiguity that that I wasn't I wasn't totally clear about going down there because it, it obviously affects claiming strategies. But um, I mean, technically, it, it appears they're going to each claim on their own behalf, okay. which changes the math in terms of when you could claim and what you can get and all that. So did, well, I'm just curious, did the lady that you're talking to encourage that or was just laying out there for them to make, she was very, um, she was, she was Switzerland. She did not necessarily provide any kind of, you know, which I think, I think is good. I mean, I think that you, you know, I, I, you could make an argument to go either way. You can claim it as soon as you can, because the government's going broke. You can say, Oh, wait, as long as you can, you know? So I think, you know, she was very, factual with the information right. you know, I, I i had some questions just to, just to confirm a few things and you know very knowledgeable it was it was a, it was a, i enjoyed it you know did she talk about survivor benefits for the surviving spouse at all or did you have to bring that up we had already kind of talked about that i mean i i i had walked them through how it worked and i and i had had her verify that i was knowledgeable in my assessment of that yeah. but yes like that was that was part of the overall discussion uh, Larry Kotlikoff, you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. He's, right, so he has written a number of times and, uh, and I actually interviewed him. Uh, one of my first interviews I ever did on my YouTube channel. And uh, he talked about how Social Security, uh, when it comes to spousal, uh, as, as widow survivor benefits, how they're they're just really, really screwing screwing up. And, it turned, and I had a client, David, just last year. And this has been going on for 10 years. Same damn thing happened. that They weren't Switzerland. They were saying, you should file, I forgot, on your own record as opposed to uh, survivor benefits uh, because you got an extra hundred bucks a month. It was just, it was bad advice. And I was yeah. like, man, I can't believe these guys are still doing this. So I think it's one of those things that if you happen to get somebody who it's almost like, like if you go to Vanguard or Schwab, you might get a good guy, you right. might get a bad guy. It's just, and that, that is not, there's no way to fix this, but it's, it's, you know, it's buyer beware, man. And no other way around that, but I'm glad to hear your, um, hey, so did you have, did you go to a private office or was it just like a cube where everyone could hear your business? It was kind of cool. They have like, so I got there before they opened. Well, the, the, the lobby was open, but, uh, like the, there was, the, you couldn't see when then right at nine o'clock, like all these, all these like metal gates for all the windows over the exact same time. So it's like, it's like, it was like a store open up because people, people that had gotten there, I, I had to wait for them to get there. So people got there early. They were already slotted in all these, all these kind of booths. But the but the gate in front of the window was closed. Then all yeah. of a sudden, all the exact same time, all the gates open, yeah. right? And so then there must have been fifteen or so people. But you know, there there wasn't there wasn't necessarily a ton of privacy, and that you know, like you're kind of it's kind of an open cubicle environment. But I mean, you can obviously talk quietly yeah. if it's a private matter. There's probably rooms you can go to as well. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. What did they bring up Medicare at all? Is that even part of the conversation? No, that, that I mean, I. I they had been there before. I, I didn't realize my my father lived actually a number of times for separate issues. So okay. uh, we were yeah. we were just there to kind of really focus on uh, the the social security retirement. 
but when you left, you felt comfortable in your own experience that Social Security Administration isn't there to take advantage of us and steal our money, essentially. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, but gee, I, I did not, but I had someone that was highly knowledgeable. You know, I think that it's like it's like anything else, yeah. right? You know, it, it, you know, maybe that's an anomaly. Maybe that's like maybe the rule versus the exception. But you know, my experience yeah. no, with, this, right. with this individual—that's all we can go off. Yeah. The only experience we have between you and me is yours, and so far that's. That's successful. What um, I, I want to turn it real quick. Uh, are you up? You got a couple more minutes. You're up against maybe it? like five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Japan. Have you done any research on Japan, David? Okay. No, I mean, I think I think it's going to be an interesting case study given like the size of their debt, their demographics, and all that. Um, you know, we'll we'll see how things go for them over the next few decades. Okay. But beyond being aware of their market environment, their demographic trends, not much. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so just, I know you got to go here in a second. Are, do you, uh, you, are you familiar with WEP and GO, uh, GPO for Social Security? So I, I, I vaguely, my, my, my knowledge of the nuances of WEP and GPO were much higher five years ago. So I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't be the right person to ask about that. So Can you address the issue? Here's another Social Security um, of claiming prior, uh, this is Social Security, to avoid Medicare rate increases. Uh, uh, that might not be something you're all that. Yeah. Um, this is a whole harmless provision, Jill. We'll, we'll get in that later. Um, anything? I'm just looking through. The, no one really kept in caps, so it's hard for me to see the the, uh, the questions. Um, all right. So, just at the end of the day, what what would you advise? As you're sitting here, we got 200 people online right now watching. If you were to sit there and say, "I'm in a conference room of a bunch of people who are interested in retirement planning," is there one or two takeaways that David Blanchett would like to be? Uh, permeated throughout this room if you had a couple of things yeah, i mean i think it's it's work as long as you can um people will want to retire but i think that your options decline significantly when you leave the workforce i think we're in a little bit of a different time right now where you know there are more options for folks but to the extent that you can work longer that's like the best thing you can do to improve your outcomes delay claiming social security um and and i think that you know for a lot of folks that maybe haven't met with an advisor before I mean, man, like if you had to pick one time to ever do that, it's right around retirement. Make sure you're in a good spot. Make sure you're making good choices because um, if you get sort of off on the wrong path, it's kind of hard to course correct, especially when you make decisions around things like Social Security. When you do have like a year, a year to change your mind ish, um, you, you don't want to make decisions that will really impact you later on in life when you have far fewer options around how to kind of accomplish your retirement goal. Yeah, right on, man. All right. Good stuff, Dave. I'll let you jump off. That's uh, fantastic. God bless. Happy New Year. Uh, bring the positive energy in the ether. But with that said, you got to call out people when they're being clowns. I'm sorry. There's too many people relying on on us, the professionals, to, to tell like it is that we can't have clowns out there, you know, taking the oxygen out of the room. So call them out. Maybe a little bit more diplomatic than me, but uh, keep doing it, brother. So hang on, guys. I'll continue the live stream. But David, appreciate it, man. I'll email you later on when this is up and you can, you know, down okay. You Thank you. Nice. See you guys. See you, man. All right, guys. So that was uh Blanche Shed, big fan. Um, I didn't realize is that.